Last week, I shared the story of when Debbie's sister bought a 100-year-old chamber pot, and her son Matt, who liked to harass her, decided he was going to grab her iPad so she couldn't use it, and how he was holding the iPad in one hand, keeping mom away at the other, and they're kind of dancing around, trying to, you know, she's trying to get it, he's keeping her away, and there's a scuffle, and during the scuffle, the iPad went flying into that porcelain antique chamber pot and smashed it. And again, I think of that story, and it reminds me that all of us sometimes get preoccupied with the lesser things in life. And in our carelessness, things that are valuable, they get damaged or they get broken. It could be a valuable object. It could be people that we love. And sometimes in our carelessness, it's our faith. So that's why we're in a series in the book of, uh, from the book of 2 Timothy titled, Guard the Treasure. And, and I, oh, she took the box. I love th- that, th- that our faith is a treasure. We don't often think of it that way. But our faith is a treasure. 2 Timothy is the final letter that we have from the Apostle Paul. Knowing that he was nearing the end of his life, he wanted to remind and encourage Timothy, his son in the faith, to focus on the important things rather than get distracted with lesser things. And so Paul states in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. The New American Bible, Standard Bible reads it this way, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Guard the treasure which has been entrusted to you. So let's just talk for a minute. What are the treasures in your life? What is most valuable to you? What is it that you protect? It was interesting. We had our grandkids over this weekend. They stayed the night. And I said, okay, guys, on Saturday, I said, it's time to go, guys. Got to pack everything up. And our granddaughter, Addison, who's usually very responsible, she just left everything and walked out the door. But our grandson, Luke, who's usually the most irresponsible, he started packing things up, and he quickly found out what is valuable to him, all of his stuffed animals that he sleeps with. He made sure he picked all of those up, and he put them in his backpack to take home because that is part of his treasure. So what is it that you treasure? What is it you protect? So keep that answer in the forefront of your mind. And now let me ask you, if you were asleep in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you were were awakened by the uh, the sound of your smoke detector going off in that, that piercing, screeching sound, and then you discover that your house was engulfed in flames, in that moment, what would you consider a treasure? What would be valuable enough that you would risk your life and go back in to make sure that it was safe and secure? Now, I'm sure it would be our children or our grandchildren or our spouse or other people. But would there be any valuable possessions so valuable that you would risk your life for? You know, I think we all have certain items that we value and we think we can't live without them. But when you put it in that perspective having to make a choice between life and death and this item, I think most of us would choose to leave those items behind. For most of us, the only things that we would risk our life for is family. And and I think about that. We may argue with them. We, We may bicker at times. We may even drive each other crazy on some occasions. But we still love and we still value them. We consider them a treasure, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to protect them. And in that moment, they are all that matters. They are the most valuable possessions that we have. Yet, is that always evident? Is it always obvious by our choices and how we treat them? I think for most of us, Most of us, we often give other things that are less valuable, things that can be replaced, a higher priority. And in the process, we become careless with our true treasures. And oftentimes we treat them as if they have no value. It not only happens with people, that happens with our faith. We saw it with Samson as we wrapped up the series a few weeks ago. Samson became so wrapped up in his own desires that he ignored and became careless with 
his greatest treasure. And it cost him a lot more than he anticipated. So Paul urges, guard the treasure that's been entrusted to you. So what is the treasure that Paul is talking about? What has God entrusted to us that we are to, to guard? Look at verse 14. Again, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. So Paul says this treasure is a precious truth. It's a truth that is not understood by the world. It's a truth that goes against what most people believe. It's a truth that will affect every area of our lives. And Paul tells us back in the very first verse what the precious truth is. He says, I have been sent out to tell others about the life that he has promised. That's the life that God has promised through faith in Jesus Christ. So this treasure and this precious truth is the life that God has promised through faith in Jesus. The treasure that God promises is not discovered by accumulating wealth or possessions. It's not experienced through pleasure and good times. It's not revealed through the world's wisdom. The treasure, the good life that God promises, is only discovered through a relationship with Jesus. But as we continue on, Paul says this tre treasure is discovered in Jesus, and it can also be passed on. Verse 2, I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you peace mercy, and grace. Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I know that same faith continues strong in you. Paul says, I serve God just as my ancestors did. And, and, and Timothy, you share the faith that was passed on from your grandmother to your mother, now on to you. Think about that. Every family passes on some sort of belief system to their children. Now, it can be the Christian faith. It could be the Jewish faith. That's what pass, was passed on to Paul. It could be the Muslim faith. And yet, in some families... It's a general belief in God, not tied to any particular religion or denomination. And in other families, it's a, a belief that there is no God, or maybe I'm not sure if there's a God, and so that is passed on to the children. And so I think it's important for us to ask ourselves, what did my parents pass on to me, and how does that, how is that impacting my worldview? Where does faith, where does God play a role and my view of life. And it's important to ask the question because if we don't, we will naturally carry on some of their attitudes, some of their views, without even knowing it. Now, that may be good, or maybe not. And it's also important to ask the question because each of us has to make our own decision about faith. Our parents cannot make that decision for us. They can do their best to instill in us values and, and a heart of faith. And they can even give us opportunities for it to develop and grow. However, parents cannot die, decide for their children. It's up to each person to respond to God and respond to Jesus. We determine our level of faith and commitment. We determine where we'll spend eternity. Our parents cannot do that for us. So what about you? Are you following your parents' footsteps? And if so, is that a good place? And if it's not, you can decide for yourself and you can change the course of your faith. And if your parents did leave you a good example, but along the way that you have gotten off track, which happens to many people, remember, it is never too late. You can change your course today. And we would love to pray with you. We would love to talk with you following the service. If, if you think, man, it's time for me to get right with God. I was raised this way, but I've gotten off track. We would like to help you get back on course. The second part of the question is, okay, everybody passes on some sort of faith. What kind of faith am I passing on? Is it the treasure that Paul speaks of? 
or is it a different version or a watered-down version that lacks substance, power, and purpose? What is it you're passing on? Verse 6, Paul writes, This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. The Bible says that God places his Holy Spirit inside of us, and he gives us special talents or abilities to carry out his work. However, usually... He gives us the gift, but we have to develop the gift. We have to to fine-tune it. And that's true whether it's sports, whether it's playing an instrument, whether you're an artist drawing a picture. Whatever it is, hours are spent training and fine-tuning the gift. I love the analogy Paul says. He says, fan into flames. A month or so ago, Elmer and Tom and I were working at the Bauer Roadhouse well, we decided we're going to start a fire, and we're going to burn some of the, the boxes, the miscellaneous stuff that's there. The problem was we did not have a lighter, and we didn't have any matches. Well, Elmer said, I know. I'll pull my car over. I'm going to use the cigarette lighter. I'll get really close. I'll, I'll get it hot, and I'll try to catch this, the paper on fire. It smoldered, but it never started. And then I remembered inside, hey, we have a gas stove, so I'll take some cardboard and and I'll put the wood in the box. I'll start on fire and and we'll start the fire that way. And so I tried. Actually, and I finally got it lit. And as I'm walking out, the fire is getting closer and closer to my hand. (laughs) And so I threw it on top of of the pile we had. It didn't ignite. And I said, Elmer, I'll go in and I'll try this again. And so I'm inside and Tom and I were looking for something that's going to start on fire stay, uh, and catch on fire and stay on fire that would get out there in time. And I'm looking and looking, and finally, Tom looked out the window. He said, well, never mind, because Elmer has the fire just roaring. And I look out, and here's this fire blazing. And I went out, and I said, Elmer, how did you get the fire to start? He said, well, I kept fanning the small embers with this piece of cardboard until it ignited. And that's what Paul's saying. That's the way that our faith works. It starts small, but we keep at it, and soon it's on fire. He says it's not only true of faith, it's true with your spiritual gifts. Though God equips us, sometimes it takes a while before we see results. And so we keep working, we keep praying, we keep doing the right thing until it all comes together in God's timing. Unfortunately, Many Christians are still operating under the same mindset and the same giftedness they had when they first came to Christ. What I mean by that is you say, hey, can you do this? And the response is, that's not my gift. They forget that when we fan the flames, God gives us more gifts to be used for him. But, but we say it's not my gift, and, and we step back. And so what happens is rather than experiencing more and more of God's blessings in this area... We bury them in the ground, and we miss out on more joy, more hope, more purpose that God has for our lives. And so if you ever took a a spiritual gifts test and you decided, this is my gift and this is all I can do, get that out of your head. I quit giving spiritual gifts tests because it was eliminating what people were willing to try. And God has so much more for you than what's on a piece of paper. By the way, the spiritual gift test, you'll never find it in Scripture. The Scripture says, try and fail to try and succeed. That's how you find your spiritual gift. Yes, God has uh, created you a certain way with certain gifts, but we don't always know them right away. And paper doesn't always reveal that either. We have to try. So please, um, fan the flames of your faith and see what God has for you. Verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So Paul's saying, don't be timid. Don't let fear win out. Don't let your doubt stop you. The Holy Spirit is living inside you, and he desires to work through you. And the Spirit will give you all the power that you need. He will fill your heart with love and compassion if you allow him to. And what we discover is when we surrender to Jesus, we find the discipline that we need to make it happen. And so we fan into flames, not by being timid, 
rather by working in the power of the Holy Spirit, loving as he loves, and having the self-discipline to do the right thing even when it's hard. Faith does not come easy. We have to do the hard things to make it grow. So let me ask you, are you fanning into flames or are you giving up? And you're giving up because, well, it's inconvenient or, well, it's taking longer than I imagined. That's not what faith does. Faith continues on. Verse 8, never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us to, a, to live a holy life. Notice he says God has, has saved us and called us to live a holy life. Now, holy does not mean sinless. Holy means set apart. We've been set apart for God's purpose. However, in that journey, God has set us apart. And in that journey of discovering what God wants for us, we will say no to, to the sin that distracts us. It says that, that also we discover that, that Jesus saved us and God saved us, not because we deserved it, but because it was his plan from before the beginning of time. It was his plan to show us grace in Jesus Christ. In verse 10, and now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ, our Savior. He broke the power of death, and he illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. See, the, we, we sang about it right after communion and then before communion. The message of Jesus is good news. It's the best news there is because it's the only hope we have to go to heaven. There was nothing else in this world that can prepare us to be in the presence of God for eternity. It's good news. And it says, Jesus broke the power of death, and he illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. And God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news. But he says, Jesus illuminated the way to life and immortality. I want you to think about that word, illuminated. It means to shine on or to remove the darkness. A few weeks back, I made a trip to Meyer. As I pulled into the parking space, I heard my, my phone slide off the center council and between the two seats. Well, as soon as I put the car in park, I reached down for my phone, but I couldn't feel it anywhere. So then I, reached, I leaned over and I looked be, uh, between the council and the seat. Couldn't see it, still couldn't feel it. I climbed into the back and I'm now looking under the seat and feeling and looking. I still could not see it, could not feel it. And I did this for about 10 or 15 minutes. I could not find my phone. And I knew it was there. I thought, okay, I'm going to go into the store. So I went in the store. I came back. I again climbed in the back seat. And I'm looking and I'm feeling no luck. So I drove home. And the first thing I did was grab a flashlight. And, and, and I, sh I started illuminating underneath my seat. And within seconds, there was the phone that I could not find. I, co I couldn't see it previously because it was in the darkness. That's what Jesus does for us. He, he, he illuminates. He illuminates God. He shows us what God is like. He can do that because he is God. We no longer have to guess or we have to wonder. Jesus shows us the best way to live. He knows the best way to live because he created us. And Jesus not only revealed the way to God, he created the way to God through his death on the cross. The good news is that Jesus took our punishment, and he died in our place. That's the good news. And when we put our faith in him, death no longer has any power over us. We don't have to be afraid of dying. And though our bodies will die and life on earth will end, we will overcome death, and we will live forever with God because of Jesus. So do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, you might want to understand the truth. He is the only way to heaven. Jesus illuminated God. He illuminated the way to life. And he illuminated immortality. As Paul said in the book of Colossians, Jesus revealed the mystery. He turned on the light. The search was over. The mystery was solved. And there was no more guessing. What was once blurry and out of focus, through Jesus it becomes clear. And I, and I, and I read that and I 
I couldn't help but go back to about three years ago when Debbie and I were visiting our, our family in Florida. When my grandson Luke, who was about five at the time, shot me in the eye with a battery-powered Nerf gun. The dart, straight in the eye, close range. And everybody thought it was funny. I'm sure I would have laughed too if it wasn't me. But I was not laughing because I couldn't see. It wasn't black, but it was like looking through one of those, uh, those glass walls where you can see shadows on the other side, but nothing, you can't really see anything. You can just see shadows. That's what it was looking like to me out of that eye. We went to the emergency room, and, and even the doctor didn't get it. He said, well, here, let me step back. How many fingers am I holding up? I said, doctor, I can't even see you. I don't know how many fingers you're holding up. And I think that describes many people in our world. That, that God is right there. He is in front of them, but they can't see him. They're blinded to the truth. And there are others who know that God is out there, but they live as though he's not there. And kind of like Samson, they pick and they choose when to obey and when to trust. That's a life out of focus. And being out of focus not only affects what they see, but it affects what they do. So Debbie and I are in Florida. We had driven down to Florida. Now we have to drive back to Michigan. There's one problem. I can't drive. They said, do not try to drive with one eye. Your, your, your depth perception will be off. So Debbie had to drive, which she hates to do. And so we got in the car, and she started pretty slow. But she eventually picked up her speed. Then we hit the mountains down near Knoxville. And just as it was getting dark, we hit the mountains. And, and within minutes, she said, I can't do this. And she got off at the next exit, and we stayed the night. Got up the next morning, started driving again, and she's doing great, going along. She's even driving past dark through Ohio. And then we hit Toledo, where there was construction. And, and she said, gripping that steering wheel tighter and tighter, I can't do this. We have to stop. I said, we are almost home. We are not stopping. Pull over and let me drive. <laughs> not one of my better decisions. So we're driving, and I'm driving very slow in the right lane with my eye patch on, very focused, so I don't hit anything. And soon, a semi pulls up to my left, and there's a cement wall on my right. And I'm going slower and slower. And in that moment, Debbie and I had a role reversal. She said, you can't drive this slow. You're going to get us killed. You have to pick up your speed. She's never said that before in her life. And I said, I can't. I can't drive any faster. It's not safe. And the point is this. When we don't see clearly, it not only affects what we see, but it affects what we do. My blurred vision was changing the way that I drive. And it was making it unsafe. When we don't see God and we don't see life clearly, it not only affects what we see, but it impacts how we live and what we do and what we say. In fact, it creates fear where we normally wouldn't have fear. Yet when we walk with Jesus daily, we see clearly. We experience life as God meant it to be. We still face struggles, because that's part of life. Yet when we do it through faith, God uses those struggles to, to teach us, to stretch us, to grow us. And he gives us the strength to overcome whatever he allows to come before us. Which is why Paul wrote in verse 12, And that is why I am suffering here in prison. But I am not ashamed of it. And listen to this. For I know the one in whom I trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Let me read that again. I know the one in whom I trust. And I am sure, I am confident that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. I want that to sink in for a minute. Many people say, I believe in Jesus. However, there is a huge difference between Believing in Jesus and trusting Jesus. Paul said, I know the one in whom I trust. I'm sure and certain that he is able. 
See, trusting Jesus is more than a mental decision. It takes action based on that truth. It places confidence in the one who made the promise, certain that he will keep his promise no matter what. And when we do that, it removes doubt and it removes fear. Trusting in Jesus results in living faithful lives full of faith. What I mean by that is we take God at his word. Just as Abraham did when God said, hey, I need you to sacrifice your one and only son, Isaac, the one that came in your old age, the one, the son of promise. Abraham took God at his word. And so we live knowing that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. Even though that reward may be different than we anticipated. When we live a faith life full of faith, we regard Jesus of greater value than the treasures of this world. And we obey Jesus because we know and we trust the one who made the promise. Because we trust Jesus, we're not afraid of circumstances or threats of this world. And because of Jesus, we choose faith rather than the pleasures of sin. So let me ask you. Are you confident in Jesus' ability to handle your situation? Do your actions reveal trust? Or are you letting fear and pleasure and lust consume you? Believing in Jesus leads to a timid faith that takes no risk. Trusting Jesus opens the door to his power in our lives, his love in our hearts, and discipline to do the right thing, even when it's hard. Believing Jesus determines whether I rise to the challenge or I shrink back in fear. So are you standing up in faith or are you shrinking back? Do you trust his plan, his purpose, his way, his time? When you trust Jesus, you are convinced that he is able. And when you're convinced that he is able, you discover the greatest treasure in life. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this day. And Lord, you've given us such a great treasure. And I, and I pray that, Lord, as we live each day, we would guard that treasure, that we would believe and trust Jesus. Not just believe in, but believe and trust and let it change the way that we live. May it penetrate our hearts, our minds, our souls, everything about us, Lord, our words. I pray that everything you have for us, we would experience, that we would fan the flames of faith and hope and trust. Do a mighty work in us and through us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.